Hello and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mahan, and I'm here to chat with you guys today about some environmental news stories and, of course, some animals. So if this is your first time hanging out with me, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back and thanks for the continued listens. Now, before we jump into the episode, a little fun news about the podcast. Recently, for the first time, I got to experience being a guest on another group's podcast. J and K over at the Fuck My Work Life podcast reached out and really wanted me to come on their show because, well, I love my job and they love animals. So how could I say no to that? So yes, despite their title of their podcast, I was on there to actually talk about how positive and how much fun it is being a zookeeper as well as of course my podcast and of course I've talked a lot about conservation and animals. So if you have never listened to them before definitely suggest going to check them out. Like I said before it's called Fuck My Work Life and if you just want to have a good laugh or hear all kinds of crazy work stories they're definitely the perfect group to listen to. And of course, if you want to hear my voice some more, you can check out the episode I was on with them, and it is labeled We Like Animals, and once again, the podcast is called Fuck My Work Life, so go check it out. Now, going on to the podcast today, why don't we get started with some environmental news. So first up, this was reported by The Guardian, monstrous sea lice and jellyfish invasions blighting Scottish salmon farms. So the article reads, Locks in the Highland of Scotland are among the most spectacular and pristine wildlife areas in Britain, attracting tourists from around the world. They are also a production line for what have become supermarket stables like smoked and fresh salmon. Now the salmon industry says fish health and welfare are at the heart of the success of the Scottish salmon farming. But a new investigation by Viva, the vegan company charity, highlights the parasites and jellyfish blighting the intensive fish production. Now, campaigners deploy cameras with underwater drones at salmon farms operated by some of Scotland's biggest producers. They recorded what they call monstrous invasive sea lice and swarms of jellyfish. Lux Rigby, head of the investigations of Viva, said the Intensification of fish farming as a solution to overfishing has created a breeding group of diseases in which salmon suffer appallingly. Now, the sea lice feed on salmon skin and are potentially lethal to fish. They are typically treated with licensed medication or physical methods, including bathing in fresh water. Viva filmed at salmon farms all over in many different locks in the northwest highlands of Scotland. Now, the footage shows many salmon infested with parasitic sea lice. The farms are operated by leading food producers supplying UK supermarkets and, of course, overseas, with salmon now one of Britain's biggest food exports. Footage taken at a seawater farm in a number of different locks operated. The world's largest supplier of farm-raised salmon shows several salmon infested with sea lice. Now, the farm's own official report counts in 2023 of weekly average female adult sea lice per fish have been between 0.03 and 5.4. Treatments for infestations are started where there is an average between 0.5 and 1 adult female louse per fish. Filming in another location showed fish lice infestations. The farm's own official report counts in 2023 of weekly average female adult sea lice per fish had been between 0 and 2.14. Filming at three farms operated by Scottish Sea Farms showed sea lice and swarms of jellyfish. A report by the charity of Wildfish warned in March that the Scottish fish farming industry was failing to contain sea lice parasites on open net farms. It found more than two-thirds of active farms, 132 out of 192, breached sea lice limits in the industry's code of good practices on at least one occasion. The report stated the rapid expansion of open net marine salmon and rainbow trout farming in Scotland in the last 30 years had led to an increased concern about parasitic sea lice infestations on these farms and that the threat that these pose to the health and survival of wild and, of course, farmed salmon. Now, the Observer reported in January how salmon deaths on fish farms in Scotland nearly doubled last year owing to growing levels of disease, parasite, and jellyfish bloom. 
Micro jellyfish, which may be linked to the warming oceans, are a particular threat, blocking or stinging fish gills, leading to death. Salmon Scotland, which represented the producers, said farms were working hard to manage these sea lice numbers. It said the industry was transparent about the challenges it faced. Dr. Ian Braille, head of the technical at Salmon Scotland, said the Scottish salmon sector is committed to our marine environment and we are constantly innovating to manage naturally occurring challenges like sea lice that affect wild salmon and farm-raised salmon alike. Salmon farmers work hard year-round to manage sea lice numbers using technology and innovation. Salmon Scotland said various factors are involved in the decline of wild salmon, such as river water quality, which is said is occurring across Europe, even in places where there is no aquaculture. Now, the Scottish Sea Farm said the recent sea lice counts at its three lock farms were low, with an average of 0.18 adult females per fish. It said high levels of micro jellyfish were found in June, which threatened the fish, and they were harvested early. Regent Jacobson, CEO of Bacafrost, said the company had significantly invested in new technology co to combat sea lice, which two vessels in Scotland installed with large tanks of freshwater treatments. Sea lice do not survive in freshwater, and it is very effective, he said. If you don't have the right tools, the sea lice numbers can escalate. We are now ahead of the problem. Some within the salmon industry believe that building fish farms on land could tackle issues including disease. In May, Aquaculture Seafood unveiled proposals for the UK's first land-based farm in Grimsby, a 75 million pound facility with 50 tanks to rear 5,000 tons of salmon a year. Animal experts, veterinarians, and academics recently wrote to Gillian Martin, the Scottish Government Minister for Energy and Environment, asking her to conduct an independent risk assessment of facilities based on land. Abigail Penny, the Executive Director of Animal Equality UK, said onshore farms would only shift the damaging impacts of salmon farming from sea to shore. A Scottish government spokesperson said our recent visions of sustainable aquaculture sets out our support for the development of aquaculture sector that operates within environmental limits and recognizes the considerable social and economic benefits the sector delivers. Whew. I know that was a lot, but very important in going over all the different kind of issues that are out there. I mean, a lot of people I know out there always talk about how Oh, farm-raised salmon is a better environmental thing than fished salmon. But, you know, there's pros and cons to each. We're still figuring it out, okay? There's not a perfect solution yet. Is onshore farming better? Eh, maybe not, because you're also clearing out all that land for salmon to be farmed in. A lot of times, some of these fish are farmed out in the ocean just because we still haven't been able to really match what all the nutrients and how the ocean acts and sometimes those fish don't do as well on land which is why a lot of people will choose to kind of do those open ocean net farming practices instead still a lot of not <laughs> still a lot of uh, unanswered questions out there and i definitely can't answer them but an important news article nonetheless then next, more salmon news, but this time in the United States and reported by U.S. News. More wild Atlantic salmon found in the U.S. rivers than any time in the past decade, officials say. So, yeah, we're going to go into a positive salmon story. Let you off with kind of a doom and gloom salmon story about sea lice. Let's go into this article. And it reads, the last wild Atlantic salmon that returned to U.S. rivers had their most productive year in more than a decade raising hopes they may have weathered the myriad ecological threats. Officials counted more than 1,500 of the salmon in a local river, which is home to the country's largest run of Atlantic salmon, Maine State's data show. That is the most since 2011 when researchers counted about 2,900 of them. The salmon were once abundant in American rivers, but factors such as overfishing, loss of habitat, and pollution reduce their population to only a handful of rivers in Maine. The fish are protected by the Endangered Species Act, and sometimes only a few hundred of them return from the ocean to the rivers in a year. 
the greatest survival of the salmon could be evidence that the conservation measures to protect them are actually paying off, said Sean Ledwin, director of the Maine Department of Marine Resources Sea Run Fish Programs. The count of river herring is also up, and this could be aiding to the salmon on their perilous journey from sea to river. The increasing runs of river herring help distract hungry predators such as seals and striped bass from the relatively rare Atlantic salmon, which may help increase salmon survival of the predator gauntlet, Ledwin said. Americans eat a lot of farmed Atlantic salmon from expensive aquaculture operations. Commercial fishers for wild Atlantic salmon in the U.S. closed decades ago due to overfishing and pollution. They once ranged south to Long Island, off of Connecticut and New York, but counts of wild salmon have been trending up in recent years. Another count of salmon at a dam locally had been over 1,000 in four of the last five years, the main data shows. That followed several years in a row when the count never exceeded 840. Now this local river once supported runs of salmon in tens of thousands in an era before intensive damming of rivers, said Dan McCall, Fisher's Program Manager, Penscott Nation. The Native American tribe has lived along the river for thousands of years, so it is a tick up compared to previous years, but in the grand scheme of things, it's still abysmal, McCall said. Conservation groups in New England had long fost on removing dams and restoring salmon. They're emboldened by the salmon's gains this year, said Neville Crapple, spokesman for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. It's going to take a commitment from everybody in the world to reduce emissions and try to negate the most severe implications of climate change. So there you go. A very positive article I definitely suggest everyone checking out about salmon. Now finally, Reported by Conservation News Online, new conservation efforts seek $1 billion for eastern Himalayas. In the eastern Himalayas, glaciers from the world's tallest mountains feed the mighty Ganges and Brahmatsa, sorry, I probably butchered those, rivers, which in turn empty into a vast delta that stretches to the world's largest mangrove forest. The interconnected ecosystem of lands and water feeds 1 billion people, sequesters massive amounts of planet warming carbon, and provides habitats for roughly 12% of the world's biodiversity, and it is under threat. The region is warming more rapidly than most and has lost more than 10% of its forest covering in the last two decades. Just last year, extreme weather displaced more than 1.5 million people. On Tuesday, the United Nations General Assembly Conservation International, Balapara Foundation, and local partners unveiled the Great People's Forest, one for the largest conservation efforts in South Asia. The initiative aims to raise one billion U.S. dollars to accelerate and scale up local conservation work, providing resources to plant one billion trees and protect and restore one million hectares or 2.5 million acres by the end of the decade. This may be the most important region in the world has never heard of, said Jason Kalaf of the Conservation International Global Leadership Fellow. It receives a fraction of the global attention and investment of other critical ecosystems like the Amazon or the Congo Basin, despite being one of the most threatened. Though our partnerships were looking to supercharge work that's already underway and put the region on the global conservation agenda, the goal is not to reinvent the wheel. An established network of local organizations are already implementing effective solutions to climate change, such as practicing regenerative agroforestry and community-led conservation. Yet despite sharing a common goal to protect the nature, local groups often inadvertently compete for the same limited resources to execute their projects. In a region where 80% of the economy depends on nature, joining forces to increase conservation is imperative, Knopf said. The eastern Himalayas is one of the most climate-vulnerable places on Earth. The people here have innovated out of urgent necessity, he added. They know what works, now we need to scale it up. For example, on the Sikma Islands in northeast India, rising rivers are eroding the soil and deforestation is increasing conflict between elephants and farmers. In response, the Balapara Foundation has helped villagers plant lemon trees and chili plants whose thorns and scent repel elephants and keep them from trampling villagers' crops. 
The plants also provide additional goods to sell at market, boosting some farmers' income by 40%. Roughly 480 kilometers or 300 miles to the south in the mountains of Nagaland, indigenous communities have conserved more than 1,700 square kilometers or 656 square miles of forest, an area more than twice the size of New York. And in the Sandbals mangrove forests of the Bay of Bengal, where cyclones regularly destroyed homes and higher salinity is killing crops, communities are restoring mangroves as storm shields. With support from the Great People's Forest Project, like these from preventing erosion in the mountains to restoring mangroves for flood protection, can grow across the region. Critically, the efforts areas as much about protecting livelihoods as they are about protecting nature, said Bethany Haynes, who leads Conservation International Strategy and in Impact efforts. Wow. Another great article, and it's kind of cool how they are looking at basically conservation from the tip of the mountain all the way down to the ocean and definitely hitting an area that, yeah, as the article said, is not as flashy as the Amazon, not as flashy as some of these other areas like the Congo and all that. Like a lot of people forget that even in areas that many people may consider very rural like the himalayas there is still tons of conservation effort that needs to be put in and that all of these different places are super important for the environment so very cool to see and that ends it for your environmental news so moving on to our creature feature, I think I really nailed the bullseye with my choice today because today we're going to be talking about a fish called the banded archer fish. So there is a number of fish that of course are named archer fish out there, but in all honesty, I choose this one because there's a bit more information out on it and a lot of these archer fish, there's not much. So a lot of what I am going to be talking about today does apply to these other archer fish, but different sizes, different colors, and of course found in different parts of the world. But for the banded archer fish, they can be found in estuaries with brackish water around mangroves. And for those who don't know, brackish water is kind of a combination of both salt and fresh water, or really what it is, it's kind of not quite salty enough to be considered salt water, but not fresh enough to be considered fresh water, so kind of mid-ground in terms of water. Now, the archer fish often ventures into lakes and rivers in search of food. These fish migrate to saltwater and freshwater areas, however, they do not do so for breeding like most other fish. Archer fish are widespread geographically, ranging from East Africa through the coastal waters surrounding Asia all the way to Australia. Now, as for the size of the banded archer fish, they average about 9 to 10 inches or 23 to 25 centimeters in length. And even though I didn't really find much on weight for these guys, I can tell you they are not very wide fish. They are actually quite thin, so they probably wouldn't weigh that much. Also, in the wild, they are believed to live about two years, where in captivity, they can live up to 10. And as for looks, their body is silver with a gold tint across their back. They have four to six vertical bands across their body. The first one kind of drapes across their eye and the last one around, sorry, their anal fit. That's what it's called. The other types of archer fish are similar in color, but some do have spots or fewer bands. This pattern is to match the surrounding colors of their environment. After all, they're living in these mangrove forests and those dark bands against that kind of bright silver and gold look makes it look kind of as sun is kind of coming through the mangrove trees and kind of creating that bright to dark pattern that is found in the water. That is what their camouflage is to look like. So archer fish colors really help them honestly disappear into the water below. Now, their dorsal fins set far back toward the rear of the fish. They have four spines, and they have large forward-set movable eyes. Now, the archer fish itself is kind of elongated and is a laterally compressed fish, making it look really thin if you look right on it. The shape of its face is pointy around their mouth and have a long protruding lower jaw that is pointed up. Now, all of these characteristics of the archer fish his jaw to its keen eyesight gives them the ability that gives them their name. 
which is why I went into so much detail about why they look this way. Because for you see, archerfish are named that way because they can shoot water and knock their food into the water. So they'll shoot a jet of water out of the water and hit their prey up in the trees to knock them down to the water for them to eat. And it's freaking amazing to see. Okay, there's tons of videos out there, so I definitely suggest checking it out on YouTube. But I was actually at this awesome aquarium where they were doing an educational talk in front of these archer fish. Now, these archer fish were actually kind of in this open top habitat. So technically, the educator could just kind of reach right over from the path and kind of have their hand above the tank. Now, the cool thing about it was they were doing a live feeding demonstration. So as this person is standing there talking to us about archer fish, she would take a stick, put a cricket on it, and then hold it up above the tank itself. And the archer fish swimming down below would shoot jets of water at the cricket on the stick to knock it down below, which was just such a cool experience to witness giving a lot more detail to than just someone talking about it and actually showing it right in front of you. It was super cool to watch. Now, how they do this is with their tongue against the groove of the roof of their mouth, they form a tube of forced water powerfully out by snapping shut their gills. The fish can squirt up to seven times in quick succession. So they kind of have rapid fire here. And the jet itself can reach 6.6 .6 to 9.8 feet, which is about 2 to 3 meters. But they are accurate more around 3.3 .3 to 4.9 feet, or 1 to 1.5 meters. Even fish as small as 0.8 to 1.2 inches or 2 to 3 centimeters long can already spit, but their jets really can only reach 4 to 8 inches or 10 to 20 centimeters. Archers usually swim in shooting parties with several shooting at the same prey. So you better be careful when you see this crew of fish rolling up in your neighborhood because they got a little Tommy machine gun water action on them and they will hit you from pretty good distances. But luckily for you, their main food source is insects. However, I have been told by certain people that work with archer fish that if you're not quick enough with their insects, they might actually shoot water at you to get you to hurry up. But they're not doing it to knock you into the water. They're just being jerks. Now, they will shoot water up at these insects who are just, you know, up in their trees, minding their own business, up in the mangroves, enjoying their day, and then all of a sudden get hit with this water and it knocks them down into the water below where the squad of archer fish are waiting. And if the insect itself doesn't fall all the way down or is a really tough insect or the archer fish itself just gets impatient, the archer fish can actually jump up to 12 inches or 30 centimeters into the air to grab the insects off their perches. And of course, maybe if one archer fish doesn't want all the other ones, he could probably try and jump in the air and catch it on the fly. Which I gotta say is very impressive with the fact that scientists don't believe the archer fish has any sort of fancy vision to it that helps reduce the refraction of the image looking up through the water. I mean, if you've ever dropped something in a river or in a pool, you already know that, yeah, when you stick your arm in or try and look down, the refraction of the water kind of shifts the image. It's like it's not directly where you think it is because the water and the light kind of tricks you a little bit. But the archer fish don't have any sort of fancy eyes to help compensate for that, except for having kind of binocular vision to them. Obviously, that's super helpful when you're trying to spot an insect that's probably four feet up into a tree, but they just learn how to focus and learn how it shoots, basically. They learn how the refraction works and compensates it before they try and hit their prey. They, of course, are not so focused up on the sky that if the opportunity were to arise for them, they also, of course, eat aquatic insects or even some small fish swimming by. Because you can't always rely on insects being above your head. Now, the archer fish is, of course, a very formidable hunter. And with such good camouflage, their prey rarely see them coming. 
However, that camo is also really good to make sure that they themselves don't become prey. With the main predators of archer fish being, of course, other large fish and, of course, birds. Also, I'm sure sharks and crocs snack on them from time to time, especially based on where they live. They are in some pretty densely populated zones for those two species. So, good camo for the archer fish, pretty important. Also, sticking together, also pretty important. Not just for hunting insects, but you have safety in numbers. Better make sure your buddies are all roughly the same size, however, because they can get hungry and when opportunity arise, if you're smaller and can fit in their mouth, they might take a bite out of you. They don't have shame eating their own species. Luckily, they do, however, make a lot of young in case they do get eaten. Because when it comes to breeding in the wild, archerfish mature at about one to two years of age. They are believed to swim from the brackish water habitats out to the coral reefs and coral rocks to spawn. Now, broadcast spawning, aka it's really just a bunch of fish coming together and basically females just kind of find a spot, start laying eggs and other fish, the males will just swim right over and release sperm as he goes over the eggs. It's just a bunch of fish all breeding at once. There is a little bit of dominance in that. Obviously, the more dominant males are going to be kind of found more in the center of these big spawning broadcast sessions. So he is more likely to fertilize more eggs, but obviously it's kind of a big mosh pit of breeding. So yeah, that's what broadcast spawning basically is. And during this, it seems to be triggered by the rains at the end of the tropical dry spell, and females can lay about 20,000 to 150,000 eggs a season. And those eggs can hatch in 12 hours after spawning, which is rapidly fast. And then those little archer fish will go out and do their own thing, trying to find food, practicing their archery skills, and of course growing very quickly. After all, in just a year or two, they themselves are going to be the ones producing the next generation of archer fish. So very quick turnaround speed for these guys. But will they even make it to that? After all, what is the conservation status of these guys anyway? Are they doing good? How are these guys surviving? Because as we've seen in many other podcasts, yeah, you can have a ton of eggs and a ton of babies, but still not doing so good. Well, according to the IUC and Red List, the banded archer fish is listed as least concern, but population trend unknown. And I did check that the last time these fish were evaluated was back in 2011. And during that time, many problems that were affecting these fish had just become a whole lot worse over the years. And the main issue being the loss of habitat. Now, the loss of mangroves around the world has been a huge devastating factor for not just animals at the sea that call these places home or even a nursery, but land animals as well that use it for shelter, food, and tropical storm buffers. Yeah. Good mangrove forests can reduce tropical storms or hurricane strength before they ever get to the mainland by providing a rougher terrain for storms to have to get through. You see, warmer waters and open ocean is two things that can really help build up hurricanes to these large sizes. And feeding more power into the storm as it moves along by not having anything to block it and way tons of warm water yeah, that's how it keeps on building. That's why when they do hit land, however, they start to rapidly decrease in intensity. They lost their kind of energy booster and, of course, hitting that land area slows down the storm and makes it harder for them to go unchecked. Now, mangrove forests, being a unique habitat around the world for billions of different creatures, are found all over being able to survive in conditions that many plants could not. Many of the locations, of course, include these so-called barrier islands that are scattered small pieces of land that create, when flourished with mangroves, basically storm barriers that help block or reduce storms, waves, and so much more before these storms ever get close to the mainland. Doesn't mean that it stops it completely, but it makes it a lot harder for these major storms to take place. Yet mangroves, the main home to the band did archer fish is under threat. Of course, global climate change and pollution are major parts of it, but the big ones are just simply we humans are just chopping mangroves down. 
We cut down mangroves to make room for agriculture. We cut them down for aquaculture, things like the prawns and other seafood we may enjoy. We talked about the aquaculture in our salmon article we were talking about. Now, I don't think they're growing salmon in the mangrove areas because salmon like cold water and the mangroves are normally in warmer water, but you get the picture. It can still have big conservation impacts even with agriculture. And we, of course, have been cutting down mangroves and destroying tons of oceanfront just in general for hotels and other such human development. So, what can we do? Well, first up is finding both agriculture and aquaculture practices that work with nature versus against it. For example, maybe don't raise a huge group of beef cattle that take up a bunch of room and resources if you live on a small island. Create food forests. They've done it in Hawaii where they cultivate the forest itself to provide native vegetables and fruit to help sustain your needs. Find aquaculture practices that possibly help not harm the environment by creating more mangrove forests to create more aquacultures you can harvest from. So instead of creating a farm that you're keeping all these animals out and only are raising one species, creating good habitat so that wild animals just simply live and are more abundant there can have the same amount of food but in a more natural, healthy way. I know many new oyster farms are made in ways that the oyster farmers not only still get a decent number of oysters to harvest, but the oyster farms themselves actually can end up improving the environment that they're around. Then of course, lastly, hotels and other human developments right on waterfronts. Yeah, maybe set them back a bit from the very important water line that can make a huge difference. Yes, you might not be right on the beach, but also you now have this massive, beautiful mangrove forest of protection from huge waves and storms which in the end will actually probably save your home because you can either set your house back, get all that protection, or put it right on front and get a storm to knock it down. The choice is yours. The other major thing people have started doing is trying to find creative ways to jumpstart mangroves on these islands that are small, hard to get to, and completely bare. One such project is trying different ways to create sort of mangrove seed bombs where a plane can simply fly over these island and people will then release these little mangrove seeds protected in some sort of dirt or charcoal, something biodegradable substance that as the seed falls, it helps protect it as it hits the ground, can help it get to the right depth and can sprout and obviously not restrict its growth and can degrade away and maybe even have some nutrients in it to kind of jumpstart the seed too. Now, this project has had various successes and a lot of times collecting the seeds and making the little bombs can be very time consuming and it has been tried of course by planes helicopters and drones also many people around the world just simply grow the seeds from seedlings and then plant the seedlings by hand which is very time consuming and a hard labor because in the areas mangroves grow yeah it's not always the easiest place to get to and when you're there you're kind of mucking around in some stuff for quite some time but these have had high success rates with those saplings reaching adulthood which then provide more protection for us and bring back habitat that billions of different species rely on every single year including the amazing banded archer fish And that's the show. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing about the banded archer fish. Now, as always, make sure to check me out on my Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok pages for updates or other stuff about the podcast. Or if you ever have questions and want to reach out, those are also great places. And of course, you can always contact me through ericlikesanimals at gmail.com. Links will be provided down below in the episode footer. Also, still down in the footer is the link to Blue Loop's 50 Most Influencer Zoo and Aquarium Peeps. So if you have a zoo or aquarium people you feel influenced by, click the link and give them a shout out and see if they can make the top 50 list. Also, don't forget to check out my guest spot on the Fuck My Work Life podcast with J&K, who are super great, fun people to chat with. I thought it was a fantastic episode. 
but you should definitely go and check it out, especially since obviously I had kind of a spin on the fact that I liked my job. I love my job and I love talking about all the fun, but also if you just want a good podcast to hear about crappy work life stories, there are plenty of those on there as well. Phew, I think that is finally it. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you all next time.